in our children's story, we have a lot of things to be grateful for this morning. And so if you want to give God thanks and give God praise this morning, I invite you to stand up as we praise and we give him worship this morning. So please stand to your feet. The song that we're going to sing this morning says, I'm yours. Everything that we have belongs to God. Our heart, our mind, our soul, it all belongs to him. Your song flows. Your song flows. 
if I could just ask projection, could you guys please put up Psalm 6 on, on up, up there for me, please? And everyone who has a phone, tablet, or a Bible, please turn to Psalm 6. And I want us all to read it in one voice because I feel this morning we, there's a need for prayer. If we could put up Psalm 6, please, for those who don't have a Bible with them. I'll give you guys 30 seconds so that we can read together. Let's all read out loud. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul is also greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, and deliver me. O save me for your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? I am worried with my groaning. All night long I make my bed to swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My eyes waste away because of your grief. Because of grief, it grows old because of all my enemies. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. D depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. D depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. 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 For the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. And the Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. And let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. Amen. So this morning, I'm going to ask everyone to please pray. And excuse me for pulling out my phone, but I just wanted to make sure I got the name correct. But this morning, we're going to pray for the family of Sister Gladys Jean. Um, apparently, while I was in meditation this morning, uh, Pastor Belzer called me just to check up on me. And he was sharing with me how this morning, um, one of our members came to church. And uh, I, I'm assuming they weren't feeling too well. And apparently, they passed out. But on their way to the hospital, she had a heart attack. And she didn't make it. So we want to make sure that we lift up her family in prayers this morning so that um, we can show our support as a loving church. Amen? Is that okay with everybody? So if you can, partner up with someone next to you and lift up the family of sister, Gladys Jean. Gladys Jean. Get with a partner and kneel and begin to pray on behalf of that family and what they're going to have to face with this sudden loss. Continue to pray, continue to pray. Lift up yourselves in prayer too. Ask God to cover you and to protect you. Ask God to heal you. 
Ask God to watch over your family also. Continue to pray for that family, the family of Sister Jean. Pray for them. deserving but it's because you have mercy it's because of your grace it's because of your favor it's because of, it's, it's because of your love that you display to us that allows us to still be here no matter how many times we betray you lord lord god we lift up the family of miss Jean. she she woke up not knowing today would be her last day she came to church like any other saturday with hopes of feeling better but some of us come into your house this morning, Lord, and we don't have the energy to give you praise. Some of us come into your presence, Lord, and we don't see why we need to give you praise. Because to us, everything is promised. To us, everything is a guarantee. And to us, nothing can ever go wrong with us because we're young. Because we're full of life. And we don't understand that things can flash before us, Lord, and change our lives instantly. So, God, we give ourselves to you pray for all of the sick at this church. 
We pray for Sister Eugene, Lord, Anderson's grandma. We pray for her health, Lord, and that you may restore her in the name of Jesus. Father God, it's not because we are saying so that it will happen, but it's because of your grace. If you are willing, she will be healed. We pray for those who have lost loved ones throughout the week. And now, Lord God, we hand over all the documents into your hands. We give you the issues with school. We give you the issues with financial aid. We give you the debts. We give you all of our problems, Lord. And we pray for a solution. This morning, join us as, as we worship you, Lord. Be with us and open the ears of those who need to hear so that they can hear. And Lord, remove all distractions from in front of us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath again, church. Good morning, happy Sabbath again, church. I guess no one's, no one has anything to be thankful for, but that's fine. I have something to be thankful for. This morning, um, we want to speak to you guys on the topic, how to love. We won't be able to break down everything to you, but we'll be specifically focus on, focusing on the love of God. As we all know, love is a four-letter word that everyone is aware of. Love is a word that everyone knows how to express, or do you? Love is to have deep affection for someone. Love is to be fond of something or someone. Love is to have proclivity towards them. To love is to like. To love someone is to be devoted to that person. To love someone is to adore that person. I can go on and on about the, the word love, but you guys get it. And I'm pretty sure that everyone in here has someone that they say they love. Am I right? If I was to ask everyone in here, what are some of the things that you would do for your loved ones? I would hear all type of different scenarios and all type of different sacrifices that we make in order to display our love towards those people. When we want to do something, we find all types of reasons and excuses to justify why we should do it, especially if it's something that we enjoy doing. So what that tells me is, if I love someone or something, then it shouldn't take much for me to do whatever it takes in order to satisfy that relationship. Are you guys with me? Are you guys with me? Especially when it pertains to God. We're talking about God, the creator of the universe. The reason why we can breathe this morning, amen church? The reason why we can walk and the reason why we can talk. And if I went around the room right now and I asked everyone if they love God, I would assume that you guys would say yes. Am I lying? So if you love the Lord and he does so much for you and you have all of these nice compliments, justly so, to give to him, then it shouldn't be a big deal on your end to spend some time in prayer with the Lord. Amen, church? To spend some time reading up on the word. To spend some time listening to sermons on different topics on YouTube. To get a starter ground and, and then going to do your own research. We all use YouTube in order to figure out how to put in our lashes. We all do use YouTube in order to how to uh, apply makeup and all of these different things. So why can't we do it for the word of God? It shouldn't take much to show up to his house with some energy and to have a reason to give him praise. It doesn't take Pastor Belazare, it doesn't take me, it doesn't take Wabi, it doesn't take Sophie in order to tell you that it's time to clap your hands or it's to stand up in the presence of God. I always tell people, if you're afraid to clap your hands, just lift your hands up. Because if you clap your hands, somebody might get it wrong. They might think you're, 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 you're giving me a round of applause, but if you lift up your hands, the Lord receives all the glory. When you, when you are in love with God, everything is done simultaneously. Because when you hear a word that you can relate to, when you hear a statement that's true, because I love him and I understand that he loves me, my praise comes out automatically. Amen, church. So today I want to focus on how to truly love God. Loving the Lord with all your soul to be specifically. The major faculties of the soul, and, I'm, and if you guys want to pull out your notebooks to take notes, the major faculty of the soul is consistent of the, in, the intellect, 
it's, consi it's consisted of the emotion and of the will. I won't necessarily have time to get deep into all three today, but I will focus on the intellect. The intellect is related to the process of thinking, the process of reasoning. Your intellect is associated with loving the Lord with your mind. Say mind, church. Matthew 22, verse 37 says, He answered, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, all of your heart meaning, another word for all of your heart meaning all of your spirit, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, meaning all of your body. Are you with me, church? And love your neighbor as yourself. Proverbs 19 verse 2 says, also it is not good for a soul to be without knowledge. It, it is important to seek knowledge. So, so the first of my three quick points are, as a Christian, you have to love knowledge. As a Christian, you have, to, you, you have to love to learn new things. The Bible encourages knowledge, and as Christians, we must love to be knowledgeable. Amen, church? Proverbs 25, verse 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, to search, uh, 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 but to search out a matter is the glory of kings. The Lord conceals certain things and we'll never understand them. But there are certain things that we are able to understand and to find out about, although we don't know what they are at first. In order to push us to go and to seek out answers and to inform ourselves more about the word, they aren't revealed to us immediately until we go and we seek for it. Say seek, church. It is a setup for us to go and to seek out knowledge. So it's not all about praying. It's not all about coming into church on Saturday morning, but in order to honor the Lord, you must respect that all of the gifts that he's given to you, which is what? A mind, the ability to have a brain, the ability to have the capacity to think and to learn. So when the Lord sees that you make an effort to learn more, when the Lord sees that you go to school and you educate yourself to get the most out of your life, even though you're born with certain gifts and talents already, you search the Bible and you learn more about the Word of God on your own, and you don't just depend on what you hear at church or on the internet, and you dedicate yourself to research, you dedicate yourself to growing, it pleases the Lord. Amen, church. Your research is supposed to lead to worship, not fear. That's my second point. Your research is supposed to lead to worship, not fear fear. A lot of us are afraid to seek out knowledge. The reason we're afraid is because we're, we're, we're scared that we'll hear something that, that contradicts the word of God. Can somebody relate to that? We're afraid of certain topics such as science because we, 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 we don't, we don't want to be faced with those other observations. But if you know the word of God and you're seeking knowledge of the word of God, it doesn't bring fear, but instead it makes you eager to hear what's being said. Because that's your God. You're in love with him. You know him. So while assumptions are being made by some of the smartest people in the room, your mind begins to conduct thoughts of its own. Because the difference is you have knowledge gained and you have the truth all at once. Amen, church. It's not everything that you hear that you need to take in. For example... The first hot take that you hear on weed, you accept it because, you, you know, it justifies your reason to smoke all day. You accept it because you like to smoke. So you don't go and you, try, and, and you don't try to figure out, you know, why, why is this um, something that the Lord wouldn't be pleased with because you heard the first hot take. But when you dive into the word, you don't change your way of thinking and, 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 and go against your consciousness. No. You understand that subjects, subjects like anatomy, stay with me now, church, subjects like anatomy, subjects like histology, subjects like biology, subjects like embryology, subjects like zoology, subjects like morphology, should I keep going, should I keep going, subjects like astrology, I mean, I mean, astrology, subjects like astronomy, astronomy, which is the study of the sun, moons, and stars, the planets, the comets, the gas, the galaxies, the dust, and the other non-earthly bodies and phenomena. Instead of being afraid, you say, yeah, that's cool, let's talk about it. Because from my understanding, in Genesis 1 verse 16, it tells us that God had made both lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. Amen, church. Psalms 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Psalms 136, verse 5 through 9. Verse 5 through 9. 
to him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. To him who, 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 who laid out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endures forever. To him who made great lights, for his mercy endures forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule by night, for his mercy endures forever. You don't just do it to gain knowledge, but you do it because you know you know the truth also. My God is the greatest astronomer, and because I took time to know my God, because I understand my God, I'm not afraid to learn because I know what my God possesses. Point number three. When you discover it, you must let the truth transform your behavior. When you discover it, you must let the truth transform your behavior. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, we see, it, we see that it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Every time the truth is revealed to you, the Lord expects you to change your attitude and your behavior towards it. The more you love someone, the more interested you are about their daily lives. Am I lying? If you're in love with somebody, you're not going to go throughout the whole day without checking up on them, without asking them how did they sleep, how, how is their morning going, how is work going, do they like their job, do they like their career, what are their interests, um, what, what sports they like to play, all type of different stuff. Whether it's in a marriage or in a relationship, um, um, in regards to your social behavior, you, from what you thought was originally okay, you have to change once you're educated on it. So meaning... If someone thought it was okay in Haiti to go to the side of the street and, and to leak, take a leak, when you're here, you can't do stuff like that. The, the, the thing is, when God reveals certain truths to you, you can't ignore it as if you don't know anymore. And then there's loving your neighbor. You can't love the Lord without loving your neighbor. You cannot love the Lord without loving your neighbor. Maybe before you thought you could, but I'm here to tell you, you cannot do it. In order to love the Lord, you must love your neighbor. Say neighbor, church. Genesis 1 verse 27 tells us that God created us in his own, what? Image. We're all his children and he loves us all, what? Equally. Say equally, church. If you love someone, there's a strong chance that you'll share a picture with them, right? You might say, hey, boo, here's a picture. Keep it in your car, keep it in your wallet, you know, just think about me. You want that person that you're giving the picture to to cherish it. You want that person to keep that picture and, 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 to, and to show you that they appreciated your gesture. Would you expect someone that you love to rip up your picture? No way. If your neighbor, so, 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 so if you look to the left of you and to the right of you, it's your neighbor that's sitting next to you, the people you walk by on a daily basis that's made in the image of God. So inevitably, if you're going to say that you love God, then you have to love those who are made in his image because that love is connected. Which is why in Mark 12, verse 30 through 31, it says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, which we're speaking on, and with all of your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Some people want you to believe that there's a way to go around it. Or they'll try to tell you, uh, 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 you know, they'll just claim that it's, a, it's just a disagreement we have. We won't really talk to each other, but there's no beef. But within them, they know it's pure hatred. They know they don't appreciate that person for real. They know they don't respect that person for real. And that's why in churches you see so many um, divided groups. This is my opinion, this is my opinion, and we can't get along. So in the end, we're the ones stopping Jesus from returning because we're not ready. In 1 John 4, verse 20, it says, Whoever claims the love of God yet hates a brother or a sister is a what? A liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. 
So, so what am I trying to say? You, you, you can't say that you love God and continue to rip people apart. You can't say that you love God and the first chance you have to criticize someone, the first chance you have to kill their relationship, you do it. You can't continue to try to throw people away with harsh criticism. You can't continue to talk behind the backs of people. This is no taking time, by the way. You, you, you can't continue to hold on to what happened in the past, a year, two years ago, three years ago. And I say this all the time. For the people who like to judge me, let me make a public service announcement. If you're going to say that I'm too young, if you're going to say that maybe I'm not married, if you're going to say that it's more dangerous for me to be so deep into leadership at a young age, go ahead and do it. My only problem is if you don't pray just as much as you talk bad about me. Because what I would have appreciated is if, is if you prayed that to God that I won't take a misstep. What I appreciate is if you pray to God that, that, that I'll actually be, be one of the young people who make it through. If you pray to God that I'll be one of the people who beat the odds. Uh, you, you know, how about you set an example and stop holding on to pointless disagreements? People hold on to things and can't get over it months after it happened. Let it go. And just as much as you talk bad about somebody, pray for them. But people's excuse is, I'm defending the dignity of the church. The same church that you don't pray for. You can't fight more than you pray. You can't argue more than you pray. That doesn't work. God didn't, God didn't assign you to argue and to, and to fight. He assigned you to be a prayer warrior. He assigned you to go and get people that are outside of the church. That's your mission. Your mission is to not sit here and to fight all day and long. So, 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 so what's sad to me is that one of the places that you can sit on full display is at church. And what I'm beginning to learn is not a power struggle. It's not really just a power struggle. It's people that's walking around and don't know how to be loved and don't know how, what it is to feel loved. I just want you guys to remember one thing. We can only give out what we've been given. Loving your neighbor just doesn't just stop at the dynamic that I just gave you. To love your neighbor or your friend is to do what's best for them. To be honest with them. To say, bro, you tripping. Bro, I, I can't continue to be as tight as I am to you because you're not living right. You're reckless. Someday somebody going to shoot you. Someday, some, listen, some, someday somebody, somebody's going to really hurt you, bro. I got to be honest with you. you your, your duty is to protect them. Your duty is to pull your sister to the side and say, listen, you're not over. You're hurt. It, it ain't time to move on. Your duty is to protect them and to not sit there and, and, and make fun out of, oh, oh, let me put you down with this person. Let me put you down with that person. Your job is to make sure that mentally they're actually stable. Your job is to bring them back in when they're abandoning God's principle. So you can't be the first one to volunteer to go out to the party with them when they say, I want to go to a party on Friday night. What are you doing? A lot of us think love is being the first one to step up and to get ready to fight when the fight's about to break out. You're not even close. Love is telling your friend the thing that they don't want to hear. Love is being honest with your friends when everybody around them is going to lie. And that's why a lot of us, we go down these wrong paths because we're around a whole bunch of sheep. And we're a sheep too. So it's a whole bunch of sheep leading each other with no shepherd. And then there's returning the love. One of the things that's connected to love is giving. Say giving, church. The Bible says in John 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I'm wrapping up. 
I know that there's some fathers in here and there's some parents in here. And if I ask the parent, would it be easier for them to give up themselves or to give up their son? They would say themselves. If you've seen a car come in and as a parent that's in love with your son, and you know that is either you let your son be killed or you save your son, but there's a big chance that you're going to die in the process. A lot of fathers will still save their child. It's true, because you love them. So the same thing is the love of God. He loved us so much that he gave up his only begotten son. He gave us everything he had at that point. There's nothing else that you can really give after that. He gave us everything. So the Lord established what we can call a fully committed relationship with us. He said, I'm not going to do the whole 50-50 thing that you guys got going on now. You know where, you know, if you're a husband, a, sp uh, a husband and wife, and you're in the house together, you're like, you know, so you pay 50% of this, I pay 50% of that. You know, you clean two rooms, I clean two rooms. You clean half of the dishes and you leave the rest for me. He says, I'm going to give 100%. And see, the difference is when you go from 50-50 to 100%, it makes a big impact. Why? Because when you're going 100%, there's no room for failure. If we're in the house and I, I pay two bills, you pay two bills. And let's say one day I don't pay the light bill. Guess what's going to happen? The light's going to cut off. But if we work together and we trust God, and simultaneously, we see that God puts everything together. Sometimes I'm going to make more of a sacrifice here. Sometimes you're going to make more of a sacrifice right here. And then when it comes together, we see a huge impact. We're never shortchanged. And that's what God does with us. In Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, it says that love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. What is the repeated word in that text? All. All of your heart, heart meaning spirit, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength, strength meaning body. God has given us love and he's given us everything that we may need. He's fully invested into us. And I can imagine the feeling in heaven as he watched his son being spat on, being whipped, being disrespected, being mocked. But, his, but Jesus knew he couldn't take the easy way out because in order for him to truly save us, he had to take all of the punishment. He put up his body in sacrifice and he shed his blood for us so that we could have a chance at eternal life. And all he's asking for you guys to do today is to love him back a little bit. You know, I wish I could go into the spirit aspect, but I won't today. Because one of the major faculties in your spirit is communion. When you com communion is basically you having the ability to commune, to connect with other spirits. So I want to ask you guys, if you're not in communion with Christ, if you're not in communion with God, who are you in communion with? Because it's one or the other. It's either the Lord or the devil. And which is why Paul states, I forgot what verse it was, but he says that I don't want you guys to be in communion with demons. But you guys go through life piling on and on and on thinking that you guys are, are invincible, eventually you're going to come crashing. Everybody crashes in their own way. But Jesus is still merciful. And he's asking you today, can you just love me just a little bit? Just as he loves you and still forgives you every day. You mess up, you come right back, and he forgives you. Do you forgive your brother? Do you forgive your church leaders? You mess up every single day. You go back to him. Spare me. Have mercy on me, Lord. You read Psalms. You sing your hymnal. You know, you search out the presence of God. But you can't even forgive your brother. And all you do is walk around talking bad about him. 
what is that? So you're taking 100% from God, and on the, on the other side, you can't even give that back. Ask yourself, are you even giving 10%? When will you begin to love your neighbor? Jesus is saying, I'm all in. He's saying, when will you begin to love me? And on this Sabbath where we're going to have Holy Communion later, I wanted to talk about love. Because a lot of us come on, on when we have Holy Communion, and what we do is we, 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 we just go in and we go out. You know, we have communion, and before they can even um, uh, say the benediction or the final song, we're already outside in deep conversation about whatever, whenever, whatever it is. I don't want you guys to just skip out anymore. How about you just show up and you at least sit down and you ask your friends to leave you alone for two hours. I gotta talk to God, I gotta get right. Just do that. How about you go into communion without having hate in your heart this afternoon? How about before you come back here at four o'clock, you go home and you pray and you confess your sins to God and you ask him to help you to forgive these people because you can't do it alone. That is not a spirit of God working in you. So what I'm going to ask you guys to do is, a lot of times we hear a sermon that wakes us up, then we fall asleep again. This time I want you guys to plan to act on it. I want you guys, I don't want everybody to stand. I want strictly people who knows that they haven't been loving Jesus the way that they should. And they want to reconsecrate themselves to God. They want to recommit themselves to God. They want to start the process. They want to, they want to build. They want to learn how to love. I want those people to stand. And I want those people to just get ready to get into prayer and to ask God to, to be merciful on them. Because life is not promised. That lady didn't know that was her last day. She was just coming to church. Unfortunately, that's how life goes. She came to church. She passed out, and now she's gone. A family that had no plans for funerals got to start planning now. That's reality. Reality is not that you're invincible. Reality is not that you will, you're going to go around fighting everybody for respect, and you're going to live forever. You know, you're going to be rich forever. You know, you're going to get away with your sins forever. That's not reality. All of us have to grow old. And unfortunately, some of us won't even get to that um, age. So what I'm telling you guys is today, if personally you know you want to get right with God, then stand up as we say a prayer and we ask God to be merciful to us. Whoever it is, just take a stand. I'm not going to ask you guys to come forward. It's your personal decision. If you want to look at your friends, that's your business. I hope your friends go in the same casket that you go in.
Father God, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I sin just like every one of these people that's in here. But Lord, you have chosen to use me. You went and got me out of the mud and you wiped me off clean. And you prepared me for this moment. I thank you so much for your faithfulness. I thank you so much for never leaving my side and for protecting me every single day that I live. And I know that if it wasn't for your grace, I wouldn't be here still. Father God, you know the problems that your people face. You know the problems that they face. You know the, the reason your youth has no energy to, to even say amen in your house is not because they don't want to. It's not because they're afraid, because they know who's in here. But the reason is because they have so much negativity going on. How are they supposed to fight one good Sabbath against seven days of inconsistency? Of watching what they want to watch, of saying what they want to say, doing what they want to do. There's no limitation anymore. Father, we bring to you our issues, and we're literally begging you this morning to say a word for us. When we don't love ourselves enough, Lord, we're asking you to please love us and to please show us how to love ourselves. We're asking that you melt away the, 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 the face of hypocrisy from us. We're asking that you, that you melt away the fake face that we put on to act like everything's okay. And we all come with baggage and sit next to each other like nothing's wrong. But we're a whole bunch of brokenhearted people. Lord, you know which one of us, Lord, in this place truly means it. You know, you know who really wants to change their lives. You know which one of us finds ourselves under friends that are no good for us. Snatch us from under them, Lord. Devour the wicked that stands to, 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 to destroy our lives. And please protect us, Lord God, as we start this process. As we start over and as we recommit our lives to you, help us, God. Show us the way. Show us what to do. Show us what to say. Show us, show, show, show us how, Lord, to display our love for you. Let us have a hunger to study your word. Let us have a hunger to pray. Let us have a hunger to, to, to find out more about you because we're all claiming that we love you, but it's all false. But thank you, Lord, for never abandoning me. Thank you for being real. Thank you for protecting us even when we didn't deserve it. We're definitely not better than anybody who, who has lost their lives, but it's by your grace and we acknowledge that. So we thank you, because on this beautiful Sabbath day, you have reminded us, Lord, what true love is. And with the small portion that we've learned today, I pray to God that we continue to learn. I pray that we continue to grow, because sometimes it's not the hype sermons, Lord, that went over hearts, but it's the ones that can teach us how to fix our lives. So, Lord, we give ourselves to you, all of us, and we ask that, Lord, you may give us a new and clean face. And now... May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding invade our hearts, our souls, and our bodies and grant us peace and traveling mercies. Protect us on our way, Lord God, and please heal our hearts, Lord, that are broken. Wash away all of our sins, Lord, as we get prepared for Holy Communion and bring us back to your house safe. Bless the rest of the Sabbath day, Lord, and bless the leadership at this church and bless all of the members at this church. Protect us, Lord, on our way. In the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Have a wonderful Sabbath.